I am pleased to welcome to the podcast in person here in our D.C. studio, Dr. Jesse Ehrenfeld, president of the American Medical Association. Dr. Ehrenfeld is an anesthesiologist, medical school professor, researcher on medical information technology, and director of a statewide health philanthropy in Wisconsin, among other activities. He's an Afghanistan combat veteran twice over, as well as the first openly gay president of the AMA and a national advocate for LGBTQ plus rights. Dr. Ehrenfeld, thank Thank you so much for coming in. You are a very busy person. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. It's great to talk to you today. So I want to start on Capitol Hill since we're here in D.C. And sure. Congress is coming back and working on a budget or so we hear. We hope they're working. <laughs> I know physicians are facing, again, a cut in Medicare pay, but that's not the only AMA priority here in Washington at the moment, right? Well, it's a big one for us. And, you know, it's really painful that uh, you turn the clock back January 1 and 3.37% Medicare cut to physician payments. It's unconscionable. And so we're optimistic that we can get a fix, uh, hopefully retroactive, as the uh, omnibus uh, you know, consolidation work goes forward, uh, you know, there's sort of this January 19th deadline coming up, um, but we can't have it. You know, physicians continue to struggle. You know, my parents lost their own primary care physician because of a challenge with their primary care doctor not being able to take Medicare anymore. And what we're seeing is more and more doctors just stopping seeing new Medicare patients uh, or opting out of the program entirely. So, you know, every other provider under Medicare is actually fighting for how many increase they're getting while doctors are getting cut. So we're, we're hopeful that we can uh, solve this, but it really is something that is just urgent for us as an association. I thought we took care of this in 2015. I feel like I, co I you know, it's Groundhog Day. I covered it every year from about 2003 to about 2015. And then we solved it briefly. Well, we, we solved one problem and replaced it with another, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, the, the, the doomed SGR uh, did die in 2015. Um, the unsustainable, sustainable growth rate problem uh, that did lead to those year-end patches. Uh, and unfortunately now, though, because of butt neutrality rules uh, and other, uh, we'll call them features of the program, uh, we're in the situation again. Uh, we do have optimism, though, that we might get some standing inflationary updates. There was the introduction of a bill last session, uh, and we hope that that can be something that does move forward once we get through this uh, time-sensitive issue to deal with the 3.3% cut. So I feel like the physician shortage is kind of like climate change. People have been warning <laughs> about it for decades, and suddenly it's here. It's here. People having to wait weeks or sometimes months to see a doctor. Obviously, like with climate change, it's going to take a while to get get out of the hole that we have dug. Um, I know we've seen the establishment of several new medical schools, both allopathic and osteopathic, in the past decade. How soon might we be able to see some relief, and what more will it take beyond training more doctors? Well, we're over opening more medical schools, but we're not actually training more doctors. And that's the problem. We haven't expanded GME, residency programs. And unfortunately, because as you know, GME funding through uh, the federal government is tied to a fixed cap in set in the 1990s by, by Medicare. We've opened all these new schools and the students have, don't have a place to go to train. So that's a problem that we, we need to solve. We've had a little tiny, tiny increase uh, these past two years, a couple hundred spots here and there. We need thousands more training spots open. We need the GME dollars to come from Medicare. We also need to solve some of the issues around how we get international medical graduates here and ready to practice in the U.S. 25% of practicing physicians in the U.S. were trained abroad. Most people don't know that. We already have a huge international workforce, but we do silly things like we'll let an international doctor train their residency here, and then we make them go away for two years uh, to their home country before they can come back. Um, there are H-1B visa waiver bills uh, that are circulating around the Conrad 30 extension. We, we need to do those things as well, unfortunately, as, as you're aware, immigration uh, reform is a challenging issue here in Washington, but they're common sense solutions that have bipartisan support, and we're hopeful that we can get some workforce pressure reductions, not just by expanding GME for our U.S. trained individuals, but also those international graduates. Yeah, I feel like people forget that immigration is about more than just people coming across the southern border. There are a lot of, of skilled worker issues in the immigration debate. In lots of industries, healthcare, technology, other places as well. Um, 
I know the rise, or should I say the re-rise, of prior authorization requirements from insurance companies is something that contributes to physician burnout and the physician shortage by driving doctors out of practice just from frustration. The Biden administration has a new regulation to limit prior authorization in the pipeline. Assuming that that regulation is finalized soon, how close will that come to fully addressing the problem for your members? You know, we hope it'll move the needle a little bit, but we need wholesale reform and we need to do more of the Medicare Advantage plans. Unfortunately, you know, I hear here every week from colleagues who are just at their wits end. Uh, and it's frustrating. I see it with my own parents. Well, I, I'm an anesthesiologist. I, I have a habit now. I ask my patients, so how long did it take your surgery to get scheduled? No, nah, it's a couple weeks or a month. I said, and how long did it take for your insurance company to approve the procedure? And it's months. And often what they tell me is they approved it and then they denied it after they approved it. And they have to go through all of this rigmarole that just doesn't make sense. So, so it's going to. You think that Congress is going to need to step in at some point, or is this something that can be worked out? I think we're going to have to have regulatory relief from Congress, and we're pushing for that through our grassroots network. Certainly, you know, we try to bring all the third-party payers together. We have a set of principles that theoretically third-party payers have agreed to, and yet they ignore them, and they continue to just harass patients, uh, really to improve their bottom line, but not do in what's their their best interests. So I want to talk a little bit about physician autonomy. Since the overturn of Roe v. Wade, we've seen an increasing level of what I call legislators practicing medicine. Uh, now we have the Supreme Court. It's OK if they have an MD. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, now we have the Supreme Court, none of whom have an MD as far as I know, uh, about to decide whether doctors uh, facing women with pregnancy emergencies should obey state abortion bans, the federal MTALA law, or their medical ethics, all of which may conflict. Um, what's the AMA doing to help doctors navigate these very choppy and changing legal waters. Choppy is a good word for it. It's confusing. And and since the decision, the Dobbs decision came out, we have been working with all of our state and federation partners to try to help physicians navigate this. And I can tell you, it's unbelievable that now physicians are having to call their attorneys, the hospital legal counsel, to figure out what they can and can't do. And obviously, this is not a picture that is a picture that supports women's health. So we are optimistic that we might get a positive ruling with this Mtala decision on the Supreme Court. But obviously, there's a long way that we need to go to make sure that we can maintain access for reproductive care. You're younger than I am, but when, when, when I was when I was growing up and covering this, they I mean, didn't want to talk about abortion because it was controversial. And they, you know, now I, certainly in the last five or ten years, uh, the AMA has come out. Do you think that's something that um, has? dawned on the rest of the, the members of the AMA that this is not necessarily about abortion. This is about the ability to practice medicine. Well, you know, look, if you look at some of these socially charged restrictive laws, whether it's in transgender health or abortion access uh, or other items, we take the same foundational approach, which is that physicians and patients ought to be making their health care decisions without legislative interference. So, and you've anticipated my next question. It's not just abortion and reproductive health where lawmakers are trying to dictate medical practice, but also care for transgender kids and adults, and even treatment for COVID and other infectious diseases. How big a priority is this for the AMA, and what are you doing to fight the sort of pushing against sort of scientific uh, discourse? Well, we will always stand up for science, and it's so important that as an association we do that. Our foundation in 1847 was to get rid of quackery uh, and snake oil salesmen in, in medicine, and yet here we are uh, trying to do some of those same things with misinformation, disinformation, and, and obviously, even if you look at the attack on PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV prevention, you know, an important part of the Affordable Care Act, right, making it basically zero out-of-pocket cost for most Americans and many Americans, um, those things are just unconscionable. We have treatments. We know that they work. We ought to make sure that patients and their physicians can have access to them. What about doctors who, who are pushing things that you know to be not helpful? We call them out, and we would encourage others to call them out. Uh, if somebody is trying to sell something that's inappropriate or uh, do something that doesn't follow the evidence, we need to call it for what it is, which is uh, inappropriate. It's not just legislators who want to practice medicine these days. We also have the rise of artificial intelligence, which I know promises both huge advances. I'm real, by the way. Yes. <laughs> but, yeah, I, yes, I can attest that you're real. At least you seem real. Uh, but obviously, our artificial intelligence um, can portend 
huge advances and also other issues, not all of which are good. How's the AMA trying to to push uh, the AMA more towards the former, the good things, and less towards the latter, the unintended consequences? Well, we're really excited about it. I'm excited about it. I, I have an informatics background. So, you know, I believe that there is so much power that these technologies and tools can bring. But we need to make sure that the technology is an asset not a burden. And we have all lived through the painful rollout of electronic health records where that just was not the case. So we did survey, uh, we do routine surveys, data is nationally representative sample in August of this year. It's on our website. Um, an equal number of physicians are excited um, about AI as they are terrified uh, about AI, are anxious, concerned, right? And we need to make sure that we have the right regulatory framework. We're very um, appreciative of uh, the ONC rule that came out out of HHS at the end of last year. Uh, certainly, the Biden administration's you know whole of government uh, approach we think is important, but that is no substitution for you know regulation. And we need to make sure that we have appropriate regulation. Uh, you know, the FDA doesn't have the framework that they need. You know, the the system set up in the 60s and 70s for drugs and biologics and devices hasn't held up. So we we know that there have to be changes. We just need to make that those change make sure that those changes only let safe and effective algorithms, AI tools, AI-powered products come into the marketplace. Dr. Ehrenfeld, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been a treat.